August 1949. The American submarine Kachino slips out of its pier in Portsmouth, England, and into the North Atlantic. The 78-man crew think they're heading off to play war games with their sister sub, Tusk. But the presence of a stranger on board, a radio man named Harris Red Austin, hints that their mission is more than just an exercise. Austin, the crew will soon learn, is a spook, a Navy spy trained to intercept Soviet military transmissions. Our Navy had always been haunted by what happened at Pearl Harbor. And as we got into the Cold War and the nuclear age, our Navy was determined that it was never going to be taken by surprise again. We were afraid that the Soviets would figure out how to build an A-bomb and how to put them on missiles and launch them from submarines. And because of that, we took the USS Cochino and we sent her out to monitor the Soviet coast to see if they were indeed testing rudimentary missiles. Cochino is practically invisible as it sneaks to within 150 miles of the Russian naval base at Murmansk. This is one of the first submarine spy operations of the Cold War. And it's about to go horribly wrong. Thursday morning, August 25th, just off the northern tip of Norway. Pacino has been patrolling the area for four days, allowing Red Austin to scan for Soviet signals. But he picks up nothing of value. And now, Cochino has to rejoin its sister sub, Tusk, for training exercises. That's when the trouble begins. Charles Cushman was a junior officer on Cochino. I had just gotten off watch and had turned in and was awoken by a very loud explosion. One of the massive batteries that power the ship while it runs underwater has caught fire and set off a series of small blasts. With several men injured and toxic gases pouring into the hull, Captain Rafael Benitez has no choice but to surface the sub and order his crew to evacuate. They're greeted topside by 16-foot waves and 40-degree water. Cachino's cook, Joe Morgan, is one of the last men to reach the deck. Instantly, he's swept into the icy water. A wave broke over and just carried me off. In a short time, I lost sight of the ship completely. And I can remember my fervent prayer to the day that, that I didn't mind dying, but I didn't want to die here. Morgan is drifting in and out of consciousness when he's finally rescued. When they pulled me out of the drink, I was about... Uh, about as cold as you can get and still be here. By this time, Cachino has alerted its sister ship Tusk by semaphore to the chaos on board. But Captain Benitez knows he needs a way of telling Tusk just how desperate the situation has become that his crew might need to abandon ship. Cachino's youngest officer, John Shelton, and a sonar expert named Robert Philo agree to be the messengers piloting a life raft through the churning waves. When the life raft got alongside of the Tusk, another wave picked it up and put John Shelton on deck and crushed uh, Philo alongside the hull of the ship. Tusk crewman Norman Walker immediately jumps into the water to rescue Philo. I wrapped my legs around them. They finally got both of us aboard. That's when the big wave come over and took 12 of our guys over the side with the cables, stanchions, and everything. Just clean the whole deck off. Robert Philo and six of Tusk's crewmen die in the frigid Arctic waters. Back on Cochino, the crew has no idea of the tragedy that's taken place aboard their sister ship. They've been topside now for more than 12 hours, buffeted by the wind and the waves. Being as cold as it was and miserable as you were up there, that uh, you uh, at times lost a desire to live. Cachino is going down, and the captain of Tusk, Robert Worthington, knows it. Left with a final dangerous option, 
He maneuvers his sub alongside its crippled counterpart. It was a miracle when these two ships come together, because with these torpedoes in both ships, you know, we're live. We broke out a folding gangway we had, and we gave them the end of it, and we held on the other end. When everything would get straight and level just for a minute, they dropped the gang board, and uh, as many as could would run across. The last man to reach Tusk, just before the plank slips off and shatters, is Cachino's captain, Rafael Benitez. And Benitez stands on the bridge, and he watches as Cachino just sinks below the waves. With 156 men crammed together inside, Tusk heads off to the nearest port. Well, the mood was very solemn uh, when we got aboard. The Tusk had lost six people, and plus the fact they had seven people they had rescued. Um, they were a tired crew. Both, both crews were tired. Tusk pulls into Hammerfest, Norway, where the wounded are dropped off and taken to a hospital. The others are given a choice. They can either be flown back to base in New London, Connecticut, or make the long trip home aboard Tusk. Every man chooses to stay with his comrades. By the time Tusk made it back to the States, the sinking of Kachino had become international news. The Soviets accused America of conducting suspicious training exercises near Murmansk. But even though Kachino's pioneering spy mission had ended in failure, the fears that inspired it proved well-founded. Just nine days after Kachino went down, American reconnaissance planes picked up evidence that the USSR had exploded its first atomic bomb. The world had entered a frightening new age. Its future hinged on who had the upper hand under the sea.